the science behind the gas for your car and whether or not the type you pump could save you money. For every high-profile missing persons case, there are so many more that go unnoticed, many times minority women. At the very least, take a sledgehammer to that door and be sure it was open. As the state tries to dismantle barriers, it's showing how difficult it's been for families. Uh, it's proven you can do anything you want after after you donate, donate an organ to someone. A Coloradan climbs to one of the highest mountaintops to make a point. Same goes for the state's U.S. House delegation, all agreeing to suspend favored trade status with Russia minus one person. That's next. When you last filled up your car, do you remember how much you spent? Probably because it's so high right now. So there's a good chunk of people in Colorado who could save money right away by changing the type of gas they put in their car. But should you consider saving money with regular fuel instead of mid-grade or premium? Our Marshall Zellinger took that question to the science and gas experts. I'll be honest, this story won't save me any money. I already fill up with 85 regular fuel. What's the deal with 87 and 91 anyway? It all has to do with getting good engine performance. John Jakura is with the Colorado School of Mines Chemistry and Biological Engineering Department. He knows science. As you move the piston up, the temperature goes up along with the pressure. First, he helped me understand how you would know if you're using too low of an octane and need the higher price gas. It may be hot enough that the molecules start wanting to break apart and start burning on their own even before the spark. That's when you start having the fuel burning unlike it was designed by mechanical engineers. And that's when you'll hear a ping, I think. Boy, if you have an engine that starts to ping, you may have never experienced it, so you don't know whether you would know. You'll know. So these are octane engines, and we actually run the gasoline that we sample through these engines. Scott Simmons showed me around the state's testing lab, where inspectors make sure you're getting the fuel type for the button you press. We actually take the samples from the dispensers and make sure that if it's 85, it's 85. If it's 87, it's 87. If it's 91, it's 91. You can see the, the knock meter here. If it fails on the knock meter, that means that it's, uh, uh, it's not the proper octane of fuel. Expecting one type of gas to come out of the pump and getting another is rare. But if it happens, you might not even know. In most modern engines, you may not know that you got the wrong octane because the computer in the engine is going to make up for that issue within the engine. The federal government actually keeps stats on how much fuel we pump. Two-thirds of Colorado drivers already use 85 regular. 18% use mid-grade. 15% premium. When you want to have premium, then you need different types of molecules. So you have additional processing steps. Boy, I remember when I was younger, my hair was not quite this gray. It was about 20, 25 cents a gallon difference. Now it's about 50, 60 cents a gallon. And it has to do with the additional processing. What's with all this 85 talk anyway? Natives, give me a second. Hi, new to Colorado. What's 85? Thanks to our altitude, 85 here acts like 87 at sea level. Now if I could get a good answer on why 85 here is priced like 87 elsewhere, Anusha. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the one constant though in all of this is actually the taxes. Right, so no matter how high prices get for gas, it's the price of oil that changes. The state and federal gas tax is the same, so it's not like roads are getting any more money, or if you're buying 85 versus 91, mm -hmm. the tax is identical, so that doesn't matter. It's the price of oil. Um, so yeah, so from a tax benefit, it doesn't matter. All right, thanks so much for that, Marshall. Appreciate it. Well, every week we've been getting messages from at least two or three people with the same exact question. Why are Coloradans still allowed to drive around with those temporary or expired tags? Some people are seeing plates that have been expired for months or even years. Bernadette reached out earlier this week after seeing a car with a temp tag that expired in December of 2020. Well, right now, the DMV can only collect late fees up to $100 after the grace period for tag renewals, but they cannot collect any late fees on temporary tags. Enforcement right now is really going to come down to whether law enforcement will pull you over for it or if parking enforcement sees you and then writes a ticket. So there is an effort at the state legislature to charge people back taxes and fees in these situations. The bill introduced by Democratic State Representative Alex Valdez and Democratic Senator Faith Winter say 
that they've got two objectives here. They want to lower the vehicle registration fees for everyone and do that by charging people who have not registered their vehicles the extra fees they owe. So this would apply to people who moved here, didn't register their vehicle in that 90 day window and people who've been driving around with temp tags for years. And then the people who have just straight up refuse to pay their yearly registration fees. When somebody goes to their DMV, they would show their previous registration, whether that be temporary or permanent, it would show when that uh, registration expired. And that would allow the local uh, county, the DMV, to assess that additional revenue that's due. The enforcement system basically can switch from being done in the field to being done at the DMV. And that I think is a is a better way to do it anyway. We don't want to increase the number of um, the number of times somebody gets pulled over. It's a dangerous situation, you know, just to be pulled over to the side of the road is dangerous for both citizens and law enforcement. State Representative Valdez has tried this before as recently as last year. It passed both the House and the Senate, but then was vetoed by Democratic Governor Jared Polis. His issue with it was that it could put Colorado over the Tabor limit, triggering a refund. Valdez says that he is restructured this version of the bill to avoid those Tabor issues. DIA is on delays. The airport wants to add gates to its concourse. That means moving more people through their trains. But supply chain issues, they have a very different plan for all of this. The airport currently has 31 train cars in its fleet. Around half are past their shelf life. So DIA wants to replace all of them and then add 10 more. Each of these new cars cost almost $3 million. Right now, the airport usually has six four-car trains in regular rotation. Sometimes they bump that up to seven during peak hours. And with the new cars, the idea is to have eight trains in the regular rotation, eventually expanding those trains to six cars each. But if they do that, it means adding a fifth and sixth set of entrance doors to each terminal stop since currently there are only four. These plans, however, have not been able to take off because the trains were ordered back in 2018 with an expected delivery date of May this year. But the supply chain issues have pushed that back to at least February of next year. However, the concourse expansion is expected to wrap up this fall. Colorado's U.S. House delegation was near unanimous on suspending America's favored trade status with Russia, all except one person. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert broke from her fellow Colorado Republicans, voted against removing Russia's most favored nation trade status, the move allowing the U.S. to slap fresh taxes on Russian goods. It did pass 424 to 8. All eight no votes were from Republicans. When someone goes missing and it starts to get a lot of attention in Colorado, across the country, almost always there is another conversation going on too. Who else is missing and why is it going unnoticed? And is anyone doing anything about it? The discrepancies in reporting for uh, missing indigenous women, we talked about um, even the disparity in the reporting. So for example, of the close to 300,000 missing women, um, a third of them are African-American alone, and that's incredibly disproportional. And yet what we hear about, right, um, are missing white women. We have finally come to a place in which we may have power to change outcomes for our communities. So when you look at the problems, it starts to become really obvious how much is lacking. The bill that's making its way through the state legislature would make it easier to report someone missing from anywhere in Colorado. It would also require law enforcement to upload information into the same state database and then cut down the wait time before uploading that information to that database. So all of this means that it's not happening right now. And that also means people are going missing, but not always reported to law enforcement or getting the attention it deserves. We are now requiring the state's Department of Public Safety to actually tell us every year how many people are missing, in particular, how many women from minority communities, which includes any ethnic minorities, the transgender community, um, and folks who are older. Democratic Representative Jennifer Bacon, one of the bill sponsors, says that this would allow them to get the data to figure out any trends and if parts of the state are having more problems than others. She did also say that this is just the start, nowhere near the whole solution. So for years... I have come on this show and I have talked to you guys about mental health. I mean, as recently as yesterday's show. And I always thought that I could empathize. But honestly, I didn't really truly understand until about five months ago. That is how old my little boy will be on Saturday. 
But just a few short months ago, I could barely recognize myself. The lowest point, I was crumpled in the closet. I was frozen. I was listening through the floor to the rest of my family, laughing with our son while I was upstairs bawling by myself. I didn't want to be around my family. I didn't want to be around my baby. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm a monster. I am lucky enough to have a husband and a mom who said, we know what's going on and you have postpartum depression. And they made sure that I got the help I needed. And then something really, really magical happened. It's something that I have talked a lot about, but I had never experienced myself. And it was other moms who were sharing their struggles with the depression, sharing their struggles with anxiety. Some were my good friends and family. I had absolutely no idea. Others were strangers who 20, 30 years later realized what was happening, but at that time were suffering by themselves. This is such a dark and scary and lonely place to be. But here I am still in therapy, grateful to be in a better place, to just love every minute with my son and handle those tough ones better. And my thanks to the parents who made sure that I did not feel alone for the last couple of months is to do the same today. Your support for the people of Ukraine is quickly becoming one of your largest micro-giving campaigns yet. She climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with a message for the world. It was this sense of gratitude to my body that, that I was able to do it after this. And she did it after donating an organ. That's next. Kyle's away working on a project tonight, but he gets really sad when he's not talking to you on TV. So we told him, here you go. Have a few minutes. A choice made by a Coloradan is putting some heat on Papa John's, you know, the pizza chain. The franchise owner, Christopher Wynn, who lives here in our state, told the New York Times that he's going to keep his 190 Russian locations open. This is other companies are no longer doing business there to put pressure on the Putin regime. Wynn was quoted by the New York Times as saying that ordinary Russians shouldn't be punished for their leaders' actions. And plus, he said, they appreciate a good pizza. Papa John's has paused all of its corporate-run business in Russia. So since last night, you have donated more than $200,000 to help the nonprofit from Colorado that's getting medical supplies into Ukraine right now. Project Cure has decades of experience getting life-saving medical equipment into difficult situations around the world. They got two shipments into Ukraine after the Russians invaded. Four more shipments are going out this week. I'd like to read to you part of a letter that they just got from a hospital in Ukraine that received one of those shipments. They wrote, this help is very timely and our hospital needs it right now. Today, our hospital, like the whole of Ukraine, is faced with incredible difficulties in a cruel reality. And although there are no battles in our area yet, we are confronted every day with the consequences of this human catastrophe. In our hospital every day, there are many people from among the refugees who lost their homes, their loved ones. There are also wounded soldiers from the battlefield. If you scan the QR code on the screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, you can join me and the thousands of other Coloradans who are supporting this week's Word of Thanks campaign to send medical supplies to Ukraine as quickly as possible. This is our chance to help some of our neighbors who can help Ukraine. Our slushy spring storm certainly delivered. Look at these totals up in the foothills. Genesee, Nederland picking up more than a foot of fresh snow. Out at DIA, 7.3 inches officially where we keep score, but around the metro area, about 4 to 8 inches overall. We did quite well. Another little fun fact for you, it has snowed every eight days or less since the beginning of the year. Yeah, it's been pretty snowy around here, but hey, we'll take it. This system is slowly moving out. Still some heavy snowfall across the eastern plains into Kansas, up into the foothills too, with a few light flurries going across the metro area. They'll continue tonight, but then move out after about midnight. Clear skies kick off our day on Friday. Plenty of sunshine out there. A few clouds up in the mountains and maybe an isolated flurry. High stay in the upper. We have a new segment this week, welcoming everyday folks moving to Colorado. Way to meet newcomers, calling it, won't you be my neighbor? Last night, we met the Wilson family moving here from Washington. They're adorable. And tonight, we extend a warm Colorado welcome to Chris and Jessica. 
They're high school sweethearts from Las Vegas who will be moving to Colorado soon. Chris rakes for a living, so I assume he's some kind of landscaper. He and Jessica are expecting twin boys this summer. That's exciting. They lived in Chicago for a while, then briefly in San Francisco. I understand that Chris really likes baseball, so maybe somebody can invite him over to watch a game. I'm told he'll be very busy for the next couple of months, but he'll probably have free time during the postseason. She donated an organ to save her uncle's life. We all have opportunities every day to do something to make a difference or make someone else's day, and this was one way of doing that. And then she climbed one of the world's tallest mountains to prove a point. That's next. Climbing one of the tallest mountains in the world, well, that's accomplishment enough. But Andrea Coleman had a little something extra to prove. She summited Mount Kilimanjaro last week, and the timing here is very important, as she tells our Corky Shoal. Oh, yeah. Big smiles, big smiles. You can continue to live the life and achieve great things and climb to the top of the world with just one kidney and be completely fine doing it. It was the best time of my life. It was incredible. My name is uh, Andrea Coleman and I'm a living organ donor. I donated my kidney on December 2nd of 2020 to my uncle Mike. I have had no ill effects from that. I've been able to do everything that I've wanted to do since before my donation. There's a lot of us coming up upon the mountain. I found a group called Kidney Donor Athletes right before my surgery. This group organized the climb with 21 other donors of Kilimanjaro. Yeah, I wanted to basically climb one of the tallest mountains in the world to show people you can save someone's life by donating an organ to them and it doesn't impact yours in, in any negative way. It was amazing. It felt incredible to be up there. I got emotional at the top just thinking about what's happened over my life over this last year, but being surrounded by these other donors. It was this sense of gratitude to my body that, that I was able to do it after this. We all have opportunities every day to do something to make a difference or make someone else's day. And this was one way of doing that, showing people that you can donate, you can save a life, and then you can do everything and maybe even more than you ever thought you could. I think we certainly accomplished that. And it's a great feeling to have done it. Andrea reached the summit on March 10th, World Kidney Day. Seven days ago, she was in Africa at the top of one of the tallest mountains in the world. Today, she was back in Colorado and back at work. It is a sign that even inanimate objects can sometimes feel like our friends. We're going to Delta County for a fond farewell and to share your feedback next. It is a sign that people in Delta County are going to miss their big, green, rusty friend. Gigi emailed us about the construction information board in Delta County. Says bye-bye, Green Bridge. It's a farewell to the bridge on Highway 92 over the Gunnison River near Delta. 82-year-old steel bridge built in 1938. CDOT says it's got structural functional issues, a.k.a. it's too old, too narrow to deal with the volume of traffic it sees now. There's a temporary bridge already in place for drivers, and some of the old bridge parts were being removed moved last month. Constructions on the new one is expected to be completed in November. I've heard from a lot of you, a lot of parents today, talking about the bravery it took to talk about postpartum depression, how that's going to help remove some of the stigma around it. Well, you guys are just as brave because you're also sharing your stories. I hope we can keep that conversation going. We'll see you next time.